Hi, Jessica. Hi, Don. <laughs> so uh, tell us where we are. Uh, we are at Portland State University, and this is Dr. Susan Masta's lab, um, which is called the Phenotypic and Molecular Evolution of Cholesterol. And who's, who's Dr. Mastis? Uh, she's a professor here at Portland State University. I am a grad student, master's student in this lab, and I study uh, spider biodiversity on green roofs. And this is your uh, lab where you work? Yes. Well, you show us inside. Okay. Come on. <laughs> Welcome to my lab. <laughs> and so is the work that you're doing here, is it part of your um, academic work? Yes. Is it your thesis for your yes. master's? Yeah, tell us a little bit about what you're doing for that. Okay, well, I'm working with um, another group of people in the environmental science program, and uh, we have eight uh, green roofs in the Portland area um, that, so a green roof is, is a roof that has um, a substrate and, and plants growing on it. Yeah, so instead of just a bare tar paper roof or something, they have yeah. the plants growing up there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we are wondering if urban green roofs are providing habitat for wildlife in some way or another, and if they're possibly a better habitat than uh, the green spaces that are on the ground. On the ground. Yeah. So. So it's a matter of like whether those or whether those animals can get up there or to the top of the roof, mm -hmm. and whether they are sustainable. So even if they can get up there, do they want to stay up there? Hmm. Is there enough food for them up there? Is it a good environment? So the different types of plants or something that might mm -hmm. be there. And yeah. so what can you tell us? What's the um, what's the benefit of the green roofs? Why are people growing roofs, uh, well, green plants on top of Well, the main reason that people uh, implement green roofs is is for energy conservation or for stormwater drainage. How does, it, how does it conserve energy to have it? Is it like so um, if you just have like a flat roof with, with a black top or a dark colored top, it's going to draw heat to the building. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so when you have uh, plants and, and um, soil up there, it actually will keep the building cooler. So you're oh, okay. spending less money on um, air conditioning. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, oh, and it, and it can also uh, reduce the urban heat island effect, which um, it's just this effect that cities tend to be hotter than the surroundings. All the heat reflecting off the pavement and roofs, everything just kind of building yeah. up and yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then as far as the water goes too, it makes sense. Is water? It's raining and water's falling on the roof. Mm -hmm. Might as well have it water some plant. Yes. Yeah. And what kind of um, uh, plants are they? Is this just? Are people growing like? Is it just for heat and water use at conservation, or is, are they actually growing like ornamentals or food or? Well, so not food. No. Um, but that's that's part of our research. Is we're actually looking at different types of green roofs. Some of them uh, are just sedum, which is a, a succulent plant yeah, yeah. that grows really well, um, and it doesn't need a lot of water or care. And those roofs have a, a shallow soil, and it's, they just plant the sedum and let it grow. And they don't maintain it, and they don't irrigate it or anything like that. And then we have other roofs that are more cultivated than that, and they might have sedum as well as other grasses and shrubs and a deeper soil. Um, and so we want to know if those more diverse roofs are providing a better habitat for... Yeah, almost certainly the more different kinds of plants you have and like blooming flowers and things are going to yeah. attract uh, insects that are attracted or pollinators or stuff. So yeah. show us something about how you're sorting this out. Do you have people who are just collecting it? Are you collecting this mm -hmm. stuff yourself or do you have well, other people? Well, we've already had one field season that I, I came onto the project after they had done all the collections already. Um, so they just gave me the spiders and they are looking at beetles. Um, and everything else is kind of, there's too many other things in there. We're just but so do they just go and sweep it with nets or something? No, or how we do have pitfall traps. Oh, pitfall traps. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And that's like a little cup buried in the ground, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's we have slippery. a little cup and it's just level with the ground and it's filled with acetic acid or vinegar. Um, and then the insects or spiders can walk along and just fall in. Um, so pretty much it's, it's only catching ground-dwelling yeah. animals and, and 
so we have a little bit of a, you know, a, a collection bias. Yeah. Um, but this field season coming up, um, I'm going to be in on the collecting, and we're going to go in and do some sweeping as well. Oh yeah. So we're going to get insects and spiders that are um, in the in the plants, in and on the plants, rather than just crawling across the ground. Yeah. The pitfall traps people use that for a lot of sampling techniques and habitats, and and just in catching stuff on the ground. So, all right. So then you've got these um, specimens um, dead in the vinegar or whatever, so then what happens to them after that? So uh, the environmental science people take the samples and they separate out the spiders and they just give those to me. And um, I take them out of the vinegar and rinse them off and put them in ethanol because it's a much better uh, storage It's like al alcohol type of alcohol. Yes. <coughs> um, the reason we don't use the ethanol on the roofs is because it evaporates very quickly. Oh yeah. So. I've also heard of them using like antifreeze or yes. something, glycol. Or antifreeze something. is the standard. Way, oh, really? But since we're doing a sort of uh, ecological, um, we want it to be more natural. Yeah, yeah. And we don't want to put anything toxic. Yeah, because the, the, the antifreeze is toxic. Yes. It's like animals drink that, it can yes. kill them or make them sick. So, can you show us some of the specimens that you've yes. gotten? So, this is my drawer of spiders. And these are all separated into vials by family and by site. So this is a particular root site. I see there's of, a lot of them in there. And those are all wolf spiders. Wow. And this looks like there's like a like hundred of them crammed in there. <laughs> I think it's more than that. Wow. Yeah. But and this is what's interesting though, is this is one particular roof on one particular collection date. And these are just wolf spiders. But then that's a lot of stuff. You can grab this, which is one particular roof on one particular date, and it has one. Just one spider. Yeah. So that's a question. Why are these so different? Yeah. Is it the date? Is it the roof? Or the kind of plants they have on there? Right. Or yeah, time of year? Or. Yeah. So why why does one roof have so many spiders and this one has one? Or what kind of plants are around it or trees that are around it or Yep. There's all kinds of questions you can answer exactly. about that. And so what else are in here? Are these all just the same thing? So oh these, no, this is different. These are the original collection bags and all of the wolf spiders and crab spiders have been pulled out and that's what's left over. Oh, okay. So right now the we're just looking at wolf and crab spiders because that's what they mostly are. The rest of these are miscellaneous. I've seen um, packaging like this before. Um, uh, I forget where exactly some specimens are, and it's nice because the little plastic bags—they don't take up as much room. That's yeah. like plastic vials. You can yeah. um, carry a lot of them around and use them more easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are all ones that have already been sorted, and then these are all the wolf spiders. These are all the crab spiders, and these are also all ones that have been sorted. You probably can't really see much of in there, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I can see the crab spiders. Mm -hmm. Wow. Are there um, a lot of different species of, um, like for example, crab spiders in this area? Is it a very species diverse? Because a lot of we don't see very much. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Species. Oh, okay, oh, we've got, got it. Peace. Great. We don't see a lot of different species of a lot of things here compared to other parts of the country. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly how many. But I mean, how many? How many do you know of that are here? Um, well, there. Are, there's the Missamina, which is probably the most visual one that you're going to see, which are not going to be in my collection. I don't know if you want. Are those to the bright yellow ones? Yeah. They can be yellow or white. Oh, they yeah, can change yeah. color, um, and those are probably the most likely ones that the average person is going to see. Don't some of them change pink too? Uh, or am no, I mistaken? they have. They just have pink lines right here. I, I've always wondered about this because I knew they could change color. It's like, how long does it take them to mm -hmm. change? I don't know, but the the yellow is like a a pigment that they they create, and it and it it. Comes to, I don't know exactly. Oh, so they actually it, have to manufacture it in yeah. order to. And then and then it can and then when they want to change back to white, they have to wait for it to. Like, okay, so it's not like a chameleon that can no. just open these different pores nope. or whatever and make. Oh, okay. I like always wondered about that. Yeah. 
So it's only those two colors that it can be. It can't be any color. Yeah, and that, but that makes sense. If they're in a, a predominantly white or yellow flower, mm -hmm. something will trigger them to make that uh, yep. to make that change. Yep. All right. So um, would you show us a couple? You have some interesting equipment here. Can you show us a couple pieces of this equipment and tell sure. us what this is about? Like, well, let's, let's start with this thing since it was right here. What well, is that thing? This is a water bath. Um, you open it up. There's oh. water in there and a thermometer. And we just use it to, um, it's, it's for DNA uh, when we want to live back on. I don't do a lot of DNA work here. Yeah. Um, that's not really my area. But um, when you, when you want to isolate DNA from a specimen, um, you have to heat it up. Get to a particular temperature? Yeah. All right, so that's a pretty straightforward piece yeah. of equipment. You just put it in there and let it sit for a while and get warm. So, okay. Um, and then what else do we have here? This is like yeah. a, looks like a really neat microscope here. So this is a dissecting microscope. Oh, wow. um, it's not, and so over here is a, a compound microscope, which most people are familiar with. Where right. You have a it's slide. And, but for this, it's lit from underneath, and you need your sample to be somewhat transparent right. so you can see. And it's for looking at really, really tiny things, right? Mm -hmm. But these dissecting scopes, you can look at a whole specimen underneath and it's lit from the top. Oh yeah, so there's two different lights that mm -hmm. light it up. Cool. Yeah. So you don't I have mean, to I've have seen smaller versions of this and yeah, yeah they're neat. Yeah. And um, is this some sort of a camera yeah. built into it? This oh, that's great. This is a camera great. so we can take pictures on the computer. Oh, cool. I mean, some of these microscopes I've seen where they have an a attachment where you can just attach like a camera to. Yeah, like, back these in the are day, specific so. microscope cameras. Wow, that's really neat. So, yeah. That'd be fun to play with. It is. <laughs> Although over here, this one's better. Oh. This is the scope that I usually use. And what this, makes this one better? It's just got better better resolution, better magnification. Yeah. Um, the camera's better. The computer that it's hooked up to is better. Um, wow, so you can look at that on a screen like that. Mm-hmm. Wow. I have some little tiny bugs in amber. I bet that would look great under there. Yeah. We'll have to try that sometime and yeah. get some pictures. Yeah. Because I just got some pictures where I took the camera and I just put it on the yeah. lens like that. I, I do that with my phone. And sometimes. it's okay, yeah. you know, but it would be much better to have it, like, uh, for more professional. This is for PCR, um, which is a polymerase chain reaction. It's, uh, it's to replicate DNA because we use such tiny animals that you can't get a lot of DNA from them. So Okay, yeah, really small samples, mm -hmm. tissue samples. So you uh, use something called a primer and it makes it so that it can make a whole bunch of DNA, of the same DNA. So you have a little sample and this it copies the sample so you have a larger amount to work with. Yes. Oh, that makes sense. And this is the machine you put it in to do all that. <laughs> and that's pretty amazing. So, like, you it must have must have to have some raw materials to manufacture the copies, doesn't it? Uh, yes, and those are all just floating around in the chemicals that we put in there. It's, okay, it's so you have like a, uh, some kind of a, a solution of the raw materials, yeah. and then it interacts with the little bits of DNA. Because mm -hmm. I've heard of that, but I always wondered how that worked. Yeah. So, and you and you just have a little machine that does that right here. Well, I mean, we have to do a lot of it manually, and then. Right. Right. You put it in the machine to process. Wow, that's pretty awesome, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then once you're done with that, you know where our, our gel thingy is, so I can't really show you. Oh, is this how you make, um, uh, you, you read the uh, DNA profiles because the little strands go yep. into a gel? Oh, okay, yeah, I've seen pictures of that, too. So you can do that right here in this lab. Yep. Oh, yep. that is awesome. The, the other part of it is over here. This is the other part of that that contraption. You just pour, so you pour it a gel, and it has like a slab of, of gel here. Yeah. And you put the DNA in wells along here, and then it has an electrical current that yeah, goes yeah. through, and it pulls the DNA across by by weight. Uh, it, I would so. love to see that done sometime. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm no expert on it, but we do it here.
<laughs> that's pretty neat. And it's funny, you hear this stuff I've heard about for years, and I sort of generally understand it, but, you know, to actually see it done would be neat. Yeah, but you can't really see the DNA very well because DNA is colorless. Right, yeah. Um, so you have to stain it. Then you stain them, yeah. Yeah, and we stain it with this uh, acidium bromide, which is very dangerous. It binds to DNA, so if you touch it, it will bind to your bind DNA. Bind to your DNA? Yes. What's it called again? Acidium bromide. Acidium? Acidium. Acidium? Acidium bromide. Yeah. Danger. Danger. Yeah. Danger. Okay, I think we get the message. <laughs> so that makes the DNA glow under UV light. Oh, so really? You put the gel under UV light, and then you can see the band glowing. Oh, that is cool. Wow, I had no idea this was had this much sophisticated equipment here. <laughs> I usually think when, when I'm talking to people that I meet in entomology, they're usually talking about labs. It's usually just sort of the place where they keep their stuff and they mm. look through microscopes and that's about it. But you guys got a whole yeah. operation well, going here. Well, this lab studies evolution, and with evolution you have to look at the DNA. Right, yeah. It's, it's a mix of morphology and molecules, because they both tell different stories sometimes and you kind of have to work with them both to really get the whole story. Um, a friend of mine that I went to high school with uh, is a professor at Rutgers and he just completed some work with um, some European uh, taxonomists too and they sampled the DNA of like a thousand different specimens of different orders mm -hmm. of uh, insects to try and get a better idea of the, their relationships which, you know, we know a lot about, but there's still stuff we don't know. But that was an amazing project. I'm sure they used equipment just like this to figure that out, but it took them a long time, a thousand specimens, and to yeah. sort all that out. It was like a whole team of scientists spending like a year or something working on it or more. Yeah. And But that's really important work. That's how we figure this stuff out. Yep. So what's this thing um, behind you here? This so we don't use this one so much anymore, but this is where you would put the gel after you've stained it in here and there's a the black, the uv light is in here oh okay so it just it shines down on it and so is this some kind of a monitor there's a screen on there so you can yeah, see yeah yeah we but this is out of commission so um but yes once upon a time you would be able to see there would be a camera right here oh, okay and you would be able to see the gel on the screen rather than having to open this and expose yourself to the UV light. So, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, because UV light is kind of bad for you too. Yeah. Is this um, just not used because it's not used right now, or is this kind we, of we outdated a, now? Yeah, you have better outdated. ones now? We have a better one in another room. Oh, okay. Um, but that entire room is contaminated with acidium bromide, so you have to put on like a mask and a, wow. a lab coat and gloves to even go in the room. So, but for so for a lab who doesn't have one, this could be a, a great piece of equipment. Yeah. Get put up on Craigslist or something. I, it's not mine to. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that interesting too? You think about how much tech advances we make so rapidly in the technology that this stuff, you know, after a short period of time, it's like we have a better one now. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty neat. And, uh, and a centrifuge, centrifuge, we know what that is. Yes. Just spins around really, really fast and separates things out from yep. different. And what's, what's that thing? I don't know. We don't use You don't that. know? Okay. <laughs> so. All right. Um, so. Um, so Susan's back, so should we go and have a look at the collection? Sure. She's got a key for the bee collection. All right, yeah. let's go over there and check that out. Is this the big one? What have you got in here? Oh, no, that's the tiny one. Oh, it's a little scorpion. Yep. We have a bigger one. Is that uh, Paroctinus sporius? I have no idea. Is it a native? Yes. Yeah. Well, they are from. This one's from Deschutes. Yeah. Oh no, this is the other tiny one. I keep grabbing that. Well, one. there's the eastern dry part of the. It likes this one likes to hide inside the pine cone sometimes. Oh, there it is. Here's the bigger one. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah. I don't have a probe or anything, do we? There we go. Yeah, that looks like the um, Peroctinus boreas, the, the dry one, yeah, and it's stored in a dry. I was so surprised to hear that they had scorpions in cool, damp 
cascade habitat. You just don't really think of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, you got a black light. Oh, yeah. You can turn the lights off, too. Oh, do you want to get out? They always want to get out. <laughs> yeah, let's get them back down in there. We'll see them. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. There you go. Yeah, that's a pretty decent sized one. Yeah? Oh, yeah. For around here. I think they're cute. I just they're, they're interesting. The way they're designed, you know? Yeah. Pinchers like a crab and a stinger like a bee all in the same bug. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Now let's look see if we can find the little one in here with this. Where is he? Oh, right there. I'm gonna move that. There we go. That's just a tiny one. Find when you have the black light. Oh, yeah. These are the butterflies and moths. These are nicer. These are sort of new modern uh, drawers. Swallowtails. Yeah, yeah very yeah. nice. Everybody loves those. Some more of them. These are actually swallowtails, too. Oh, they just don't have tails. Yeah, they're high altitude versions of them. So they have found up in the mountains. Oh, there's a famous monarch now. Loroquin's Admiral, that's a common butterfly here. We don't have a lot here. But. Mm. Oh, Painted Ladies, that's the one all the kids raise in school. Oh, yeah. From <laughs> the Red Admiral. Red Admiral, yeah. Yeah. Pretty nice collection. Yeah, the morning cloak. In uh, England, those are the same species found in England. They're called Camberwell Beauty. Huh. Let's look over in this box, see if there's some moths over here. Yeah. Let me do that. What do we have? Only a couple there. Yeah. There's that Arizona one. Let me turn that. Let's look at these, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, these are nice specimens, but they're pretty faded out. When they were mm -hmm. fresh, they were really bright colors. And these moths fade the a tree. lot. Yeah. That's our... I think that's Urialis. I don't think it's um, Gloveri Columbia. I think that's a different one. Hmm. There's no data label on it that I can see. There is one. It just doesn't give the location, though. It's a Samia. Yeah, that's a that's an old genus. Mm. That's an old uh, or a mistake. Oh yeah, little moths. They're kind of boring, but those are important for economic importance. They are forests not and stuff. boring. <laughs> Thanks, moths. They're just not as charismatic. They're not flashy. <laughs> Oh, and then we got grasshoppers yeah. and crickets. So that's not. It was one that had quite a few. There we go. Yeah, that's yeah. a nice sample of them. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Okay. And then we got one more case over here. Let's look over here in this one. Or two more, I mean. What did we have in here? I forget now. Oh, yeah. The other groupings. So we've got bees. Oh yeah, lots of bees. nice bumblebees. That's actually a good collection. Yeah, I want to see that get used by Xerxes Society. Uh, yeah, lots and lots of bees. Some flies. Flies. Tiny. You can Tiny barely little. even see those flies. I know. You can only see the labels and the blocks that I they're know. on. <laughs> That's a lot of work, though. Someone works really hard on that to yeah. get those um, mounted like that. Yeah, these are all flies. I don't know. There's yeah. some bigger ones. Yeah, robber flies are cool. I love robber flies. Yeah. And then what's in this one? Bugs, true bugs, and... Hemiptera. Oh yeah, water striders, giant water bugs. Cicadas. Hoppers. Hoppers or something. Oh, assassin bugs. Plant bugs. Stick bugs, diaphemerata probably, cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty nice. A lot of good stuff here. Stone flies, dragon flies. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good stuff. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here, pull a few out and show us what we've got here. All right, we've got lady beetles, ladybird beetles, or ladybugs, yep. whatever you want Lots to call them. Lots of those. Them. Um, 
Let's see. There's weevils. Just a few little ones. Lots of little tiny ones, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Little, well, little bugs are important too. Yes. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh yeah. Burying beetles. Yeah. Some blister beetles. Yeah. Fruit. Yeah, those are cool. That's a nice collection of them too. Yeah, there we there go. There we go. Geneva Grammar. You know, just a good example of well laid out. Yeah, look yeah. at that. See, each of these is a unit tray. So you're supposed to have like one species in each unit tray. Mm -hmm. And these are useful. You can pick them up and move them around. Mm -hmm. And if a leg or something breaks off, it just falls in the tray. So you can keep track of them. But those are nice big series. You get a whole bunch of one species and you can see all kinds of variation, size and shape and just like color differences or something. So. Um, it's yeah. actually good to have those. There's some bigger ones in this one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, those are nice. These are the beetles that, um, they're mostly desert beetles, although they are found in other habitats, too. And if you disturb them, they stand on their head, they put their butt up in the air, and yeah. they have a chemical that they <laughs> release that um, smells really funky, and I'm sure it tastes bad. Do you know that this was used as a seasoning? What? In the Southwest, yeah, the indigenous peoples ate mostly corn, right? That was their staple. So you'd have a big pot of uh, uh, corn porridge and you would throw one of these beetles in there and the uh, chemical would diffuse throughout it be like um, a spice, <laughs> you know, a subtle spice. And they do this in Asia too, these uh, giant water bugs and Morchinibes. Oh yeah, those are carabids. Yeah, these are carabids. Oh, is that Omus? Yeah, those are cool. That's a nice one. And these are the snails. We get back here, and then people like, like, okay, give me your vials, and then there are all these things that they put in their pockets. They don't I, have any I remember labels. that happening <laughs> when I was in that class. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, okay, well, we'll pin them, right? So mm -hmm. they can practice pinning. But yeah, there's no, you know, I can say they were. So look like uh, round worms or something. Yeah. yeah. Ascarids? No. Uh, dried up worms. Dried up, and even yeah. stuff dried up like this, if you well, put preservatives back in there, they'll often yeah, dehydrate and be pretty good. I have tried that with un quite yeah. a few of them where I didn't want to lose them. Did you get some good results for that? Some yes and others no. It's What's a, that? It's a rat. But it's infested but it, with worms. Oh, so wow. So. Uh, that is too I cool. took a course in college. I studied human peristology oh. many years ago. That'll change your view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Parasites are fun, aren't I they? I love parasites. Fascinating biologically, yeah, but okay. as I've sort of traveled around and been in places, yeah. you know, I'm kind of like, no, nah, I'm going to wear rare shoes. Don't eat that. Don't drink that. <laughs> don't, don't go in a, there. A fist and a moose lung. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, Parasite life cycles are pure science fiction. Yeah, I know. That's exactly what I always mm -hmm. tell the class. I say, read a book. Yeah, <laughs> stuff like, uh, you know, Dicorellium dendriticum and stuff where they, you know, possess the ant to do things they normally wouldn't do in order to complete the yeah. life cycle. And well, and that's like, I remember telling you when I was in invert zoology about the alien. That, I don't know if you remember cause it's like three no, years anyway, ago, yeah, but tell me there's, story, yeah. there's a, the movie Alien and then there's like sequels, Aliens, and Alien 3, and so on. But this alien has this crazy life cycle. It starts out as an egg, and then it hatches into this thing called a face hugger. <laughs> and it attaches to a human's face and like lays something into their, inside of them, and then it grows inside of them and then bursts out of their chest, and then it's like something completely different. And it's and then it and then it grows. It molts. I'm assuming because um, it looks kind of. It reminds me of a parasitoid wasp. Oh. And and um, but yeah. It's I'm not really that far fetched compared right, to stuff that like really happens. Or something like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sponges. Oh, bristle worms. Yeah, and those have been drying out, and the corks are stuck in them. Oh no! Yeah, I would like to. So I upgrade the containers. You get just the break them open. I don't know how to get the cork out. Oh yeah, you can dig a cork out if you have something fresh to put it in, and new medium. But that's the thing is, I don't even know what. When the time comes. In. Yeah. Well, thank goodness for the internet because we can figure this stuff out. You know, based on other people's. I've had people just from that. Um, is this a support human? It's the, is that the peanut? Mm -hmm. Peanut worms, Aww. yeah. 
I've seen those out collecting. Yeah, me too. I see a lot of stuff. I don't know yeah. what it is. Um, uh, even for that isopod video I have, mm -hmm. people have contacted me from collections and said, how do I preserve this or how do I preserve that? And I'm like, I don't really know. But I mean, yeah. in some cases, I gave them the formula that my friend used for preserving uh -huh. that thing. And so there's a lot of people being able to connect yeah. with this information. There's probably a bunch of people who are going through exactly what you're going through, only this they're a little farther stuck. down the road. And I broke it off. And they'd be yeah, happy to... This is stuck to the bottom. Oh. I was going to lift it up. It's all dried out yeah. anyway. This room has been too hot. Yeah. And Just leave it be for now. So there's probably somebody who you can find right. who knows exactly what you need. Right. But like, I'm trying to work on spiders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or pseudoscorpion or whatever. So it's kind of like, oh yeah, and I try to do it. I wish I had time to work on all yeah, this. Yeah, I mean every year when I teach in Vertzo, I get, you know, I do, that's when I make the most progress. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, it's like that collection sat there that insect collection sat there for 60 years and nobody messed with it. They just messed it up. Yeah. Now we have it, so now yeah. it's all. Yeah, here we yeah. go. Oh. And now we're. It's going to be great, right? Yeah. It's all fixed up and. Beautiful. Octopus. That's really well preserved. Yeah. But they got some musculature to them, so it makes sense that they're yeah, a bit so sturdier. Easier than preserving a joke. Intact, poorly preserved. Oh, this one's got oh, some color. That might have been that dropped. Dropped? No, oh, one, one of the Is this in a non standard jar? Oh. Is it a folder yeah. jar? Coffee and jar? Typical. Yeah. It's a coffee jar. Mm. Oh, my goodness. These are cool, though. Baby food jar. Oh, this one's a little cute little polka dotted oh thing. My gosh. Wait a second. Is there is there fish in there too? That is um, Basiloides conspicillum. That's a, a clown trigger fish. What? I don't, oh my gosh! I don't oh know, my gosh! Wow! I don't know why it's in there with an octopus, it's but that is five nineteen. It's definitely a clown yeah. trigger fish. Huh? Maybe the octopus was eating it. I don't know. Wish we'd have given some well, data. Well, there's other jars like that that have like squid. A, someone just grabbed a whole bunch of stuff. Wow. There's a bunch of stuff in the jar now. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. I know. I always tell people to say, oh, that's a big beetle. And I say, well, think about the grub. It's going to be about 30% bigger because <laughs> it takes all that energy to turn into an adult. Because it's got the, the fi this one has fish. It's got oh, two fish what? in it. Oh, it's got fish yeah, actually got fish in, in the... Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So that's the Portuguese that manowar. Yes. Yeah. That's so cool. Right, let me set it against a good background yeah. and get a nice look at this. Wow. That is so awesome. You know, because I have this marine invertebrate collection, um, you know, people go, oh, do you have any specimens? I'm like, no, no, I don't, can't preserve those. I'm not sure something like this would work for me because I have to move them around all the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. But still, and just and to be... Fragile. A, yeah. So those, yeah. And then what's this and one? This is Valella, Valella. They're by the wind thing. Oh, there. yes, yes, yes. I have, a, I have a specimen of that. My friend Soleil found some on the beach. And she goes, I got something for you. <laughs> Just a dried, you the know. The problem is, I mean, they're beautiful blue. Yeah. And right. So that's the thing with these liquid. Right, but you can still get an idea of what the animal yeah, looked like. Yeah, exactly. You know? So what, ideally, what I'd like to do is put, um, associate pictures that I've been taking of all the organisms with them when I display them in the lab. There's no date on that. Nothing. None of the wet collections were. Wow. And I think there was a notebook that accompanied them. Which has disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's like, oh, it's in the notebook. See, and just like, no, no, no. Yeah. Had code that numbers. Number, and that yeah. notebook is gone. Yeah. And the room that it was in has been taken over by other people, and everything was thrown out like 20 years ago. So that's the other thing is like because of that, I can't like probably apply for like National Science Foundation funds because mm. it's those aren't um, without having. You know, the collection. Not scientific data. No, uh, yeah. no scientific no, no scientific right. value. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now some of the beetles are. Yeah. They are, the beetles are in better shape. And giant wasp nest. Giant wasp nest. <laughs> so cool. You should look at the other side. Yeah. On the inside. Oh, you can, you can get a look in it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look at that. You can see the layers. Yeah. Very cool. So cool. Yeah, I've heard of these being built in, like, barns and stuff empty spaces that are just ignored and yeah. they keep adding to it year after year after year if it's a good space. And I've heard of specimens of these nests being like, you know, 
eight feet wide and ten feet long, and there's I don't know. I read about a someone, million wasps in it or something. I, I read about a woman who uh, had a guest bedroom that she didn't use for a long time, and she went in there one day, and the wasps had built a nest in the bed. Oh my gosh! Like inside the mattress. <laughs> oh, like in the box spring, I bet. Yeah, yeah, probably. Oh, great! Yeah, that would be a yeah. nice night's sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's.